to the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast. Today's podcast features Arnie Gunderson's presentation, A Road Less Taken, Energy Choices for Our Future. This presentation was given at Johnson State University in Johnson, Vermont, to a group of students, some of whom are considering careers in the sciences. For coming. Um, yeah, I'm Arnie Gunderson, and for those of you who are taking notes, there's, a, uh, there's an E in Gunderson, and there's an E in, in Fairwinds. Um, a couple of things before I, I, I start here. A lot of the Fairwinds team is here with us. Um, Nat, our uh, the videographer, is here. Um, and Samantha over in the corner, and we're giving away some uh, um, uh, free book uh, bookmarks if you if you sign up for our list. And in the back of the room is is my wife Maggie. Um, she's the creative force that um, uh, that th- th- our web presence and the the, the strategy for for Fairwinds is uh, is hers. And of course, Les is on our uh, is on our board. So there's uh, you got. Five of, uh, five of ten, probably, people that are actively involved in the room right now. Okay, um, Les asked me to speak a little bit about my background, um, but the, the speech today is about a, um, a, a, the transition that America is facing and the world is facing um, uh, in, the, in the 21st century. And the, I really think Robert Frost's poem really, really touches on that uh, that really well. Um, I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere in ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. But we're at a junction like that right now. This is the United States right now. We're right there at that Y in the road, and we have an energy choice to make. And um, this presentation is a little bit about what your future will be that's different than what my future uh, was. Okay, a little bit about my background, as, as Les said. I was, um, I, I grew up in a town of about 20,000 people, like Winooski, Burlington size. Um, my father was a carpenter, my mother was a, a homekeeper, and then uh, um, when I was in high school, became a, a, a assistant for a doctor. Um, so I was the first one in, on both sides of my family to, uh, to go to college. Um, I, um, when I went to college, this is before uh, calculators, you know, the, the, we used slide rolls. And um, uh, it was interesting, it was also before cell phones. We had to go down and use this, the phone in the dormitory. Um, and one of the um, most uh, important guys in the dorm was an electrical uh, engineer who developed a dialer for the, for the phone so we could constantly call the girl storm so as soon as somebody hung up on the other side, our phone would get in. So that, this is back when technology was, not, uh, was in its infancy. Um, I did my, my master's thesis on something called cooling tower plume visibility and the computer I used was about as big as this room but two stories high. It was an IBM 360. Cost two million dollars, and, and now in my in my MacBook Pro, I have more computing power than than that uh, that computer ever had. So uh, things have certainly changed. So I wound up with a master's degree in nuclear, and um, I, I was licensed on a research reactor um, that used bomb grade uranium. Um, we had enough uranium there to build five nuclear bombs in our in our reactor, and you were required to have a degree to run that. Interesting career path here for those of you who are interested is, um, you know, Vermont Yankee and other reactors don't require a college degree to become a nuclear operator. You can become a nuclear oper- operator at Vermont Yankee um, on, a, um, on a high school degree. The, um, um, the, the research reactor, because it was bomb grade material and, uh, and um, uh, in any event, we needed to have a, a master's degree. Uh, then I became a senior vice president in the nuclear industry, and um, I had groups that worked for me around 70 different nuclear plants. Um, to make a long story really short, I became a nuclear whistleblower in 1990. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the web about that. Um, and um, I had to recreate my life, and Maggie and I um, um, you know, were pretty much driven to our knees. We were driven into foreclosure and bankruptcy. And uh, then you come out of it, and the life moves on. And we started the um, Fairwinds. Um, and um, initially, it was a really uh, a geek site for uh, expert reports. And then came Fukushima Daiichi. 
and I was on, um, the CNN asked me to be their expert, um, and um, the fifth day of the accident, I was saying to people, uh, this is as bad as Chernobyl and possibly worse. At the same time, the United States government was telling everybody it's nowhere near uh, Three Mile Island, which was a much lesser accident. Uh, and the, the Japanese weren't even admitting it was that bad. Um, so um, Fairwinds, our site, uh, took off. We put videos on the site. And we went from 80 visitors a, a, uh, um, a day to 10,000 a day in uh, literally in a, in a two-day time span. It was a, it was a crazy ride. Last, last year, I, I spoke with um, Sharon Abadi, a Nobel uh, Prize winner, and uh, um, Helen Caldicott, who was nominated for a Nobel Prize and whose organization um, actually got a Nobel Prize, uh, you know, calls me three times a week. Uh, and um, ju just last week, I, was, um, I, I gave a presentation with uh, Naoto Khan, who's the former Prime Minister of Japan, and um, uh, he was the prime minister during the accident, um, Ralph Nader and a group of other people. You know, so who would have thought that a, a, a carpenter's kid from New Jersey could uh, be on the stage with Nobel Prize winners and, and, and Ralph Nader? So that's been the arc of a career with a lot of bumps in between. All right, now let's talk about what, uh, what we're really here to talk about. Um, you probably heard of this term nuclear renaissance. And going into the 21st century, um, the momentum was that we would be building lots of nuclear power plants to avoid global warming. And the accident at Fukushima Daiichi changed all that. Um, f power plants were becoming increasingly cost, uh, costly. But on top of that, though, public perception that a plant couldn't blow up like a bomb, that, it, um, that nuclear power was inherently safe, was, was shattered with the accident at, um, at Daiichi. So it, it, literally overnight, especially in Japan and, and Germany, and we'll get to that a little later, um, the public's perception of do we really need to rely on nuclear moving forward is a, is a dramatic uh, change in a fallout from Fukushima Daiichi. Um, the experts claim the chance was one in a million of an accident. Uh, do your math here, put a million in the numerator and there's 400 nuclear plants in the denominator. And that works out to be a nuclear accident about every 2,000, 2,500 years. So if we build all these nuclear plants when the Parthenon was built, we would have had one nuclear accident by the experts' numbers. But historically, we've had five meltdowns in 35 years. You know, do the math, 35 divided by five is an accident every seven years. So the real world data is showing that the experts are, are, are wrong by orders of magnitude. Um, the other piece of it, though, is the expense of nuclear power. It's incredibly expensive because it's incredibly dangerous. And so, uh, you know, you look at these big, robust plants and you, there's a hubris that sets in and you say, wow, look at how strong that is. Well, the reason they're that strong is because the forces inside them are enormous. And if we don't look at the forces inside, you can be lulled into a complacency about how, how, these, how rigid and how robust these plants really are. But in fact, a plant the size of Vermont Yankee is holding inside a room the size of a bedroom three million horsepower of energy in one bedroom. So when a plant blows up like Daiichi, it's because the horses got out of sync and tripped over each other and broke through the wall that was designed to contain them. Um, it's a business that has to be contained 24-7, 365. And if it's 24-7, 364, you wind up with Fukushima Daiichi the next day. Well, the old technology, the 20th century way of making nuclear, of making power was a central station power plant. This is a coal plant. This is a nuclear plant. They're very robust and they're huge and they're usually located remotely from population centers. The, um, uh, the, uh, this had to be done in the 20th century. There was a lot of changes that occurred in 1990 to, to 2010 that have fundamentally changed this paradigm. But the paradigm that I grew up with and that you started your life with was power had to be generated in a large central station power plant and that 
it, um, it was remote and there was large transmission lines that, um, that led, it, led into the site. Um, the quick briefing here on, on nuclear. Um, you know, we look at Vermont Yankee and they say clean, safe, reliable. Um, I think they said that about Fukushima Daiichi one day before the accident too. But the, the part of the nuclear fuel cycle that has the least environmental effect is the power plant itself. The front end of the cycle though has an enormous amount of environmental contamination and the back end of the nuclear cycle when you get rid of the waste is where of course will leave a legacy for generations to come. It's called the nuclear fuel cycle and nuclear proponents like to think of it as a circle where you put fuel in, you burn it up in a nuclear reactor and then you recycle it and run it through the nuclear reactor again. They propose it as a closed loop tire sort of. In fact, it's a, it's a flat tire. This is the, the fuel cycle as people in the uh, nuclear industry would like you to believe. And um, it starts with mining. And um, the, the mining then removes uranium from the fuel and then it gets enriched. And I'll talk about these in the next two slides. So the, the, the ore has very little uranium in it. And there's a process of enriching it that then runs through a nuclear power plant and uh, gets stored in a fuel pool. And right now, that's where it stops. There's, there's no end to the cycle. We're not reprocessing and we're not storing the waste. We're sticking it in a fuel pool uh, 100 feet above ground at Vermont Yankee and at other plants. There's enough, um, the fuel that's in the pool at Vermont Yankee, there's 35 years worth of nuclear fuel in the pool at the very top of the building. Um, there's more cesium in that fuel pool, radioactive cesium-137, than in all of the bombs that were ever exploded in the atmosphere. 700 bombs were exploded in the atmosphere between 1945 and 1980 when bomb testing stopped. All of those bombs release cesium in the atmosphere. There's more cesium in Vermont Yankee's pool than in all those bombs. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the mining side of uranium. Okay, a, a ton of, of rock that comes out of the ground that has uh, uranium in it has about a kilogram, sorry, has about a kilogram of, um, of, of uranium in it. So, so uh, I'll, I'll avoid kilograms here. Um, but we'll go to pounds. So a, a, a ton of rock has about um, two pounds of urani uranium in it. But that uranium can't be used in a nuclear reactor because most of it is the stuff you can't use, uranium-238. Less than 1% of, um, uh, of the uranium in that two pounds is in fact usable in a nuclear reactor. So you have to enrich it. And what happens when you enrich it, that ton gets you 10 grams. A gram is a dollar bill. So a ton of dirt gets you the equivalent weight of $10 bills of uranium that's usable in a nuclear reactor. So when you see an open pit mine like that, you have to realize that all of that dirt is coming out of the ground and for every ton of dirt that comes out, you're getting the, the, the weight of $10 bills in usable uranium. So it's an incredibly labor intensive and environmentally destructive process. One of the things that happens is that the liquid, and you can see the liquid here at the bottom <coughs> here, and also over here, whoops, sorry, over here, that's called the, um, uh, that, that is very acidic water. And it turns out there's a lot of studies out now that show that nuclear power plants kill more birds than windmills. And the reason is it's not at the nuclear power plant. You know, if it's a windmill, you see the dead bird right at the base of the windmill. At a nuclear power plant, the birds die in this acidic water. So the migratory birds coming down fly over these leaching ponds, land in them thinking it's a, it's a lake and then die. So um, when, you, when you compare these technologies, um, windmills are in fact much more benign as far as even killing birds than is, uh, than is nuclear power. You can, you can get a feel here for the 
amount of environmental uh, damage to get enough uranium to run Vermont Yankee for, for 12 months. Okay, now the next thing that happens is that ore then has to be enriched. Remember I said that the ore is uranium, but 99% of that is uranium-238. So you need to get 235 to run a nuclear reactor, and that goes through something called enrichment. It's converted to a gas, uranium hexafluoride, and spun. Uh, I have a slide after this is about the spinning of uranium. But what comes out is enriched uranium that goes into a reactor like Vermont Yankee, and then um, depleted uranium. Anybody have heard that word, depleted uranium? Yeah, a couple of hands up here. Um, depleted uranium is, as far as the nuclear waste site, nuclear cycle goes, it's a waste. But the military uses depleted uranium in warheads um, because it's something called pyrophoric. Um, it, it burns with a fire that water does not put out. So the M1 um, tanks, uh, 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 bullet that it, that it shoots out the barrel. The shell uh, fires something called a flechette, which is a high velocity round. There's no explosive in that. It's all depleted uranium. But when it hits steel, another tank, the friction causes it to explode spontaneously with a fire that cannot be put out. Uh, interesting here for Vermont, um, the Gatling gun in the uh, A-10 war Warthog, which the uh, National Guard used for years, was actually tested over here at the National Guard uh, testing range, um, and uh, uh, they used depleted uranium rounds when they were uh, when they were testing that uh, uh, that that gun. Okay, so let's move on th throughout the cycle here. That part of the process is heavily subsidized. I was out in Utah three weeks ago, and there was a, a, a uranium mine, and all of these mill uh, tailings, the waste from the uranium mine were laid along the side of the Colorado River. Um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, insisted that the owner of that facility um, uh, put aside $6 million to clean it up. Well, it's a billion dollar cleanup. And the owner declared bankruptcy and that billion dollars is ours to pay, which is effectively a taxpayer subsidy into the, um, uh, into the cleanup, into the nuclear fuel cycle. If you look at all of these subsidies over all of the years, nuclear is not cheap. A uh, Union of Concerned Scientists did a study that shows that nuclear power is about subsidized to the tune of about five cents a kilowatt. Now, what does that mean? The Vermont Yankee was going to sell power to Vermont at six cents a kilowatt. And in fact, that, that was too pricey for the, for the market. But in fact, if we strip the subsidies out, the power coming out of Vermont Yankee should have been 10 or 11 cents a kilowatt, which would have made it much too costly for, um, for anyone to ever um, uh, consider as a fuel source. So the reason we have nuclear power right now is because it was a heavily subsidized fuel source for 70 years. And moving forward, the subsidies on new nukes, darn it, I did it again. Um, and are also, we're building a new generation of, of nuclear power plants. Those subsidies are also on the tune of about five cents a kilowatt. So if you strip the subsidies off the table, you'll hear people say, well, wind power is subsidized. Well, nuclear is the most heavily subsidized of any power source out there. Um, and if you strip it off, we never would have gone down this nuclear road, uh, the path we started in the 60s when I was, um, when I was in college. Okay, I, I promised I'd show you what um, enrichment cells look like. And uh, uh, these are centrifuges um, that you put in uranium, and you think of uranium as a heavy metal, but in fact it's converted to a gas and it's spun at incredibly high speeds, 50,000 revolutions per minute. And because U-238 is a little bit heavier than U-235, the 38 moves out and the 35 stays behind and you wind up enriching in 235. Well, this process, not only does it create uranium for uh, nuclear power plants, it creates uranium for bombs. And proliferation risks with nuclear are, um, are something we all should worry about as the world gets more and more uh, uranium power plants throughout the world in countries that are a little less stable than the United States. 
This is a map of, of um, countries that have uranium and have made bombs. That's the pink, uh, the, 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 that's this pinkish red. United States, Russia, China, France, England, and, um, and Israel, and also North Korea. Um, and then um, countries that have forsworn nuclear power, uh, countries like Canada, Australia, uh, Japan, um, Norway, uh, have, have not forsworn nuclear power, but have forsworn the enrichment of nuclear power. So the, um, uh, the Swedes, for instance, buy their uranium from somewhere else. They're committed not to enriching uranium because they don't uh, want to be part of the risk of, of nuclear proliferation. Okay, um, we all learned from Daiichi that nuclear plants can explode. Um, if you, I, I thought about putting the, the famous picture of, uh, of the plant exploding, but I'm, I'm sure you've seen that. Um, we had hydrogen explosions at three of the nuclear reactors that destroyed their containments. Um, the containments are meant to contain, they're the last barrier of defense, and um, um, the containment was, uh, was breached not once, twice, but three times at Fukushima. This is not a one in a million chance. This is a one in a million, million, million chance. 18 zeros afterward, the chance of that happening, if you believe the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's numbers. But our process, you know, his history shows that we had three meltdowns in three days with three explosions and containment failures. Um, the, the other piece of it is the, the cost. This is another one of those subsidies that doesn't enter into the balance sheet. To clean up after Fukushima Daiichi, it's going to cost a half a trillion dollars. Now, the power that Japan, the cost in power that Japan saved by building nuclear power plants is less than that. So, um, you know, the claim that we need to build nuclear power to because it's because it's cheap. One accident at Fukushima Daiichi wiped that sheet clean, and in fact, now the Daiichi accident costs more than Japan ever saved by running 50 nuclear power plants. Um, I see some people taking notes from my slides. I, I, we, will, we will post this up on, online and probably leave a copy with Les uh, as well, so that way you'll, you'll have a copy of the, of, the, of the PowerPoint. And the other piece of it, that, fifth, that half a trillion dollars, that's just money. In addition, there's going to be about a million cancers as a result of Fukushima Daiichi. And, um, you know, there's no value you can place on a human life to ever make this equation work out correctly. Now, so we started with the uranium waste, and then we're talking about the nuclear power plant itself. And then moving on, what are you going to do with the waste material after you've burned it in a nuclear reactor? Um, this is a nuclear fuel pool, and it actually does glow that color blue. It's something called Sharenkov radiation. And uh, I was up on the refueling pool at uh, another power plant once, and the, the lights on the pool went out. The lights in the room went out. We have a power outage, a short power outage. And um, it was really beautiful. The whole room uh, was just bathed with this blue light coming up from the water. Uh, but it's truly frightening, too, because it's, uh, uh, when you see that, there's extraordinary radiation below that. So the water is used as a shield to, um, uh, to prevent people from, from dying, and then separately it's used to cool that. Um, if one of those bundles, if just one of those bundles were to be lifted up into the, uh, into the air, everyone in this facility would die within an hour. That's how much radiation is in one of those fuel bundles. Um, this is a, a reprocessing plant in France. So the alternative to storing it in a nuclear um, uh, fuel pool is to reprocess it. Um, the French are trying to do it, and uh, they've had uh, uh, very poor results. They've contaminated the North Sea with the liquid radioactive waste releases from this plant, and a lot of the nuclear waste from this plant um, never did get recycled, but are sitting either in France or in Siberia uh, waiting for someone to figure out what to do with this waste. So, you know, it, it's presented as a nuclear fuel cycle, as a circle 
Um, but in fact, um, it's, a, it's a flat tire. There's a great movie, and, and if you're going to watch one movie on nuclear power, it's this movie, Into Eternity. And it talks about waste disposal. After you've got this nuclear fuel out of the reactor, the theory is that you'll put it in the ground and keep it there for 10 half-lives. And the half-life of nuclear fuel is 24,000 years. So 240,000 years, uh, uh, it has to be stored in the ground. And this movie um, explores that concept of how do you store something for a quarter of a million years when you know the United States has only been around 250 years, and and uh, you know essentially written civilization has been around for um, about um, you know 2,000 years, maybe 3,000 years, and we're yet the human hubris is such that we um, we want to believe that we can store this for a quarter of a million years. Quickly, there's an alternative to this, and I, I like to use the analogy of a tree. Now, a tree doesn't have two or three really big leaves that generate all of its energy. A tree's got thousands of small leaves that generate its power. Well, the old way we made power in the last century was to have a couple really big leaves on our tree. And then, but the, the future doesn't look that way to me. The future looks to be thousands of small sources of power each feeding into a, um, a what was called the distributed grid. Um, the, today's energy starts with a large power plant, and that large power plant feeds everything. Tomorrow's energy, in, in, in your lifetime, um, you'll see power plants in neighborhoods, you'll see power plants in small industrial facilities, and you'll probably see a few large central station power plants as well, all feeding each other. And what's the difference has been, it's the computer. The computer has allowed us to integrate this power grid so that the solar array on my house can talk to the solar array on somebody else's house. When somebody needs power, there's power to, to send. It's called distributed generation. And in the 21st century, it's very likely to be the way that power will be generated. Okay, so you know the drill on these distributed sources, I'm sure. Um, there, there's wind power, and uh, you know, there's a lot of different sources. There's the traditional uh, three-bladed um, machines that you see, but there's also uh, wind turbines that are being developed, which are um, a little less, uh, uh, have a little less visual impact on the environment. Wind power is one source. Of course, you know solar. Um, this was cool because this person came up with a wind-solar hybrid on the theory that when it's not windy, the sun is out, and when the sun's not out, it's windy, uh, which is true most of the time. There's a couple other sources that are, um, that are worth thinking about in the future. There's small hydro, small hydroelectric. Right now, we get our power from large hydro, uh, largely from Quebec, but also on the Connecticut River, uh, but small sources of hydroelectric. But also, up in Ontario, they're looking at wind turbines underwater, essentially, water turbines. And they would sit underwater, and as the river flows through, they would spin and generate electricity, just as if the propellers were pushed by, um, by the wind. Um, and of course, waves are another possibility. As these things float up and down, they would um, uh, generate power from the wave action. Being lifted up and down would spin a generator that would make power. Um, right here in Vermont, we've got a, uh, a, a renewable source, and that's the McNeil plant. Have um, you ever seen the McNeil plant, anybody from, you know? That uses um, uh, biomass, and it's burned in the plant. And while it creates carbon, it's different than the carbon that comes out of a coal plant, because the trees have absorbed the carbon from the air, and that carbon then, McNeil puts it back up into the air. McNeil doesn't introduce any new carbon into the air, like digging coal out of the ground, which was from some dinosaur a couple million years ago. Um, actually, not a dinosaur, less right, it was probably a plant. But anyway, you know, that coal had trapped that carbon in its underground. So when you burn that coal, you're introducing new carbon into the air. McNeil doesn't do that. McNeil takes 
um, uh, carbon from trees above ground, and they're sustainably harvested, by the way, and then burns them, uh, not releasing any new carbon into the atmosphere. Um, other ways, of course, is geothermal. Iceland gets a large portion of its power from geothermal energy. Now, Vermont may have one source. There's um, uh, actually there's a source on the Connecticut River of very hot groundwater. Um, but in general, we don't think of uh, geothermal in Vermont. And um, um, the last one here is fuel cells, which convert hydrogen directly into water. And then the process, the only thing they give off is water and electricity. So all of these are in the mix for the future. Um, there's, a, there's a fuel cell technology out uh, now that's about the size of a pickup truck that would run a, a, a neighborhood on the order of a couple hundred houses. And uh, uh, you know, so we may wind up with fuel cells in our individual neighborhoods running on hydrogen, emitting water and electricity. Okay, now the, the, the real question, I'm sure you've heard it. Well, what do you do when the sun doesn't shine? What do you do when the wind doesn't blow? And um, th that calls for the last piece of this puzzle, which is uh, actually being commercialized as we speak. How do you store sunlight? How do you store wind power to get you through when the, when those parts of the cycle that are um, um, uh, when the wind isn't blowing? Well, my question to you is, would you rather store nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years or would you use that same intellect to figure out a way to store electricity overnight? To me, the, the choice is clear. I'd rather use the, um, the uh, developed sources for storing power. And we're actually seeing that as we speak. Um, a nuclear plant costs around $5,000 a kilowatt to build. Um, you can get solar at about $2,000 a kilowatt. But of course, the sun isn't always out. But the storage is now down at around $1,000 a kilowatt. So solar plus storage is now less than nuclear power. And that's a fundamental change. And that's one of the reasons why the, um, the world is moving away from these large central plants to solar on your roof, solar in a business. Um, solar actually they're talking about in the windows of a home. Um, another possibility for storage is something, you'll hear about this in the future, V2G. V2G technology is vehicle to grid. You'll have an electric car and when, um, when you're home, you'll plug it in. So the grid is sending power to your car. When the grid needs power, if you don't need to use your car, you authorize your car to send that power back to the grid. So vehicle to grid, the battery in your car that gets you to work or, or, um, or to Johnson State. Um, when you get to Johnson State, you plug it in. The car charges when the wind is blowing and discharges into the grid when the wind isn't blowing. Vehicle to grid technology is already being worked on. Um, another possibility is using the electricity to compress air. And the compressed air would be put in large underground um, caves, caverns. And then when the wind isn't blowing, the, the air comes up and spins the turbine as well. Um, another storage mechanism. Another storage mechanism is using a flywheel. You know, when you were a kid, you ever have one of those, it's a boy analogy, I'm sorry, one of those little cars, and you set it down and it spins. When you get that car going, that noise you hear is a flywheel that, that you're winding up. And then when you let it go, the car moves. Well, flywheel technology is like that too. When the, when the wind is blowing, uh, a flywheel is spun up. And so that when the wind is not blowing, the, the flywheel gives back that energy to the grid. What this does is, this concept of distributed power minimizes transmission losses. For my Yankees, I'm 100 miles away from here, and 10% um, of the power from Vermont Yankee is lost in the transmission lines. So um, what this does, by having the power where the load is, the solar power on your roof, um, you don't lose that power. There's no transmission losses. So by going to a distributed system, you wind up picking up 10% uh, right off the bat because you're not using um, a large central station power that's far away from the grid. That's an important piece of the puzzle going forward. And all of this technology already exists. I use Japan as an example here because they shut down, after the accident, they shut down 54 nuclear plants. 
Um, and they have right now no nuclear plants running. And, uh, and life in Japan goes on. First thing they did was conserve. Um, and um, you know, I was there twice in the last year. And in the summer, their buildings are at 80 degrees. Um, that's, um, uh, you know, that's a lot warmer than one would expect. But when you realize it's 97 outside, it still is a, a, a pretty dramatic reduction. But um, we can do that. Better light bulbs, uh, more heat efficient buildings, turning the heat up in the summer, turning the heat down in the winter is the first thing we can do. And anybody in this room can do that. We don't need a, 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 to be high tech to, to succeed at that. But I looked at Japanese manufacturers and found out that um, Sony was developing wind power all throughout Japan. Mitsubishi and Hitachi were working on heat pumps all throughout Japan. Toyota was working on, on solar power all throughout Japan. So all of these technologies are available in Japan, but had been prohibited from going on the grid by very powerful electric monopolies. Well now, since Fukushima Daiichi, the game has changed and um, the, the monopolies are caving in and we're, more of these sources of power are allowed to enter the grid. Um, this is uh, what I would call um, the, the energy success story of the last three years. The Germans shut down nine nuclear power plants right after Fukushima Daiichi because they were of the same vintage as Daiichi. And then the other 20, roughly, are going to be shut down in the next 20 years. Well, October 3rd, two weeks ago, Germany generated 65% of its peak power from renewable sources. That's windmills and solar on the peak of the day, midday, they generated 65% of Germany power. This is not a third world country. It's the largest, one of the largest exporting countries in the world. And they had um, um, literally the other power plants had to, uh, had to either shut down or export out of Germany because the Germans had 65%. For the day, for October 3rd on a whole, 33% of their power came from renewable sources. So the Germans are well on their way to figuring out how to do this, how to get a distributed network. And are there hurdles? Sure. But are there hurdles to nuclear? I think Daiichi showed us, yeah, there's, there's a lot of hurdles to, to nuclear that we have yet to, to, to conquer. So when um, a utility, a large utility says, well, what do you, how are we going to do this? You know, the mentality of that, um, that institution is the only way to generate power is a large central station with a the transmission line to your house. In fact, the Germans and, um, and other nations, but Germany is the, is the point person here, are actually showing that, in fact, there are alternatives. This distributed generation of power is likely the way to go. And if the Germans can do it in Germany, they're gonna make a heck of a lot of money throughout the world because other people are gonna want it too. There's a chance to make money here, which is what I told the, uh, the Japanese. I wrote a book. This is another thing a carpenter's son never thought he was going to do. Uh, but the title is Fukushima Daiichi, The Truth and the Way Forward. Um, and, um, and, and we talk extensively about the fact that the Japanese have the opportunity to wean themselves from nuclear and become an export powerhouse on renewables if they choose to. Okay, uh, to conclude, let's go back to the Robert Frost poem. Uh, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. I'm sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler long I stood and looked down <clears throat> one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere in ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled and that has made all of the difference. We're at that junction in the road and um, there's an opportunity here for the United States and the world to choose a different route than we did last century. And I believe that that route will be renewables with a distributed generation system. All right, well, thank you. And let's take some questions.